It's Sunday morning, December the 2nd, 2012, and we are in a study on Sunday morning. We've been in the study on the book of Revelation. We did a Revelation series, oh, some years ago, about four and a half years on Sunday night. It was 236 messages. We went through every verse, every word in the book, every culture, custom, idiom, and metaphor, and we're still in that, and this has taken us into a study on prophecy. Now, prophecy is about Christmas, and Christmas is about prophecy. Christmas is Christ Mass. It's Roman Catholicism. It's Christ Mass. And the Mass is eating human flesh. When the Roman Catholics raise the little Eucharist up, like so, and they raise it up, and they pronounce the word hocus corpus eum fili. And they say those words, and they say that turns into the literal body of Christ, and when you walk down the aisle to accept the Eucharist, you're accepting Christ, that's where that comes from, and that is the Mass. The Mass is the focal point of all uh, Roman Catholicism. It's, it, it, it's, uh, it, it focuses more on that than it does anything else in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Christmas is Christ's Mass, and Christmas is the same thing that Israel was involved in called Baal and the Grove. Baal and the Grove. The Grove was the Grove was the tree goddess. The word is Asherah, A-S-H-E-R-A-H. And that's the tree goddess. That is the Christmas tree. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil out of the garden. Now, Asherah means upright, upright. Now that is the female deities and all in Baal was just, that means the Lord. It was a common word, a Hebrew word that meant Lord. It was used uh, commonly on people's names. Uh, Eth Baal means with Baal. That was Jezebel's father. And Baal was the same thing as Hercules. Hercules, uh, Adonis, Adonis, uh, Tammuz, Zoroaster, and the list goes on and on. All these were just, they were types of the original prototype, Nimrod. And Nimrod began the Babylonian system in Genesis 11 and 4 when he said, let us build us a city and a tower and let us make us a name. That verse has affected me as much as anybody, anything in the Bible because the Bible says in Revelation 17 and 4, that Babylon was the mother of all harlots. 17 and 4, Babylon mothered all idolatry. Harlot is the word pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. And it means idolatry. Idolatry is the word, it, in the Greek is the word E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. Idololatria is a construction of two words, ido, meaning to see or perceive. Ido, meaning to see, perceive, and latruo, meaning to serve. Idolatry means to serve what you put into your eyes and ears. Ecclesiastes 1.8, the eyes not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The mouth will not simply utter it and say, I want that car, I want that woman, I want that house, I want that money, I want that fame, I want that recognition, I want that fortune. It will labor to fulfill what we put into our eyes and our ears. And one of my favorite idolatry verses is over there in Ephesians 5 and 3 when the Bible says, A covetous man is an idolater. And Colossians 3 and 5 says, Covetousness is idolatry. Covetous is the word pleonectes, P-L-E-O-N-E-K-T-E-S. And that word covetous, pleonectes, means to means to want more. Now, anybody that's ever wanted more, you've been an idolater. Has anybody ever wanted more? More money, more recognition, more applause, more house, more car, more. Uh, we have a hard time learning to be content in whatever state we're in, don't we? Now, Israel was involved in this thing called the Christ Mass. It was Baal and Grove. How did Christmas get into the church? Very quickly. Just quickly, and then I'm going to get back into prophecy, because prophecy has to do with Christmas. 
Christmas came into the church by Constantine. He was the ruler of the entire world. He was the ruler of all the world, the Eastern and the Western Empire. And in 325 A.D., he was about to lose the empire to, the, to these hordes of barbarians that is rampaging across what we call the European continent. And these hordes were the Huns and the Vandals, the Vandals and the Visigoths and the Goths. The Visigoths, I put them separate because these were some of the most dangerous people to the Roman Empire. They were not unlike uh, uh, terrorists is what they were like. They lived on horseback. They, uh, I always think of when I think of the Visigoths, I think of some movie and you got some guy in there with a, a big leg of lamb or something. He's chewing on it and he's growling, going, ah! That's what I think of when I think of the Visigoths. The Visigoths and the Vandals and the Huns and the Gauls and the, the Gauls and the Celts and the list goes on and on. There are just, they're just dozens and dozens of these hordes. Well, Constantine said, I'm going to lose the empire to these hordes if I don't do something. If I don't, if I don't for about 200 years prior to Constantine, in 325, 325 A.D., he met at the Nicene Council. And in this Nicene Council, they drew up a, a bunch of uh, bylaws to go by. And he said, I've got to amalgamate the gods of these people here in, uh, into the so-called church at that time. And he amalgamated the sun and tree gods into the church so that he could pacify the heathen he wanted to get heathenism and Christianity to shake hands. People say that Constantine was a Christian. He was not a Christian. Lactanius was his son's tutor. Lac Lactanius was was one of the if one of the foremost, if not the foremost, historian in the world at that time. Well, if you rule the Eastern and Western Empire, you can you can. Uh, uh, hire the smartest man in the world. In fact, you can, uh, you can bring him into your family. It, it's not a matter of whether he wants to or not. You bring him in, and he brought Lactanius into his family, and Lactanius uh, was his son's tutor. Well, when it was said at the Malvian Bridge, Malvian, at the Malvian Bridge, when Constantine was fighting Maximus for the empire, it was said that Constantine saw a cross in the sky and that, that he heard some voice say, you need to go conquer by this cross. Lactanius said what he saw was an X. Probably two clouds come together and he said, what does that look like to you? Uh, it looks like Mickey Mouse to me. What do you think? Well, it looks like Donald Duck. You know, you look at a cloud and you can see a face or something. Lactanius said he saw an X and he's supposed to go conquer by this. Well, the labyrinth of Constantine, they took the X, which is not an X. In the Greek language, this is, whenever I point up here, you guys with the camera, point up there. Don't let me, whenever, on the camera, it's, they show up to here. But this is an X. It looks like a big E. That's an X right there. This is not an X. This is a key, a C-H. C-H, like C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S. Christos is the word Christ. That's a C-H. Well, what he's, it was said that he saw was an X. Well, he added the R. He added the R, which is, this is an R right here. Their R is like our R with the front leg knocked off of it. So he added the R to the key, and that's called the Labrum of Constantine, and that's on all the Roman Catholic vestments. And that actually says C-H-R, C-H-R Mass. So whenever men would advertise X Mass, that's actually Roman Catholicism, but Christmas is Roman Catholicism. That's where you get the X Mass. My father, being an old country Baptist preacher, and his friends would all just scream bloody murder when I was a kid down in Texas, and they'd see X Mass sale at some store. That's exactly what it is. It is not Christ Mass, because Jesus is not in the Mass. Now, where did this come from? One more time. Where did Christmas come from? All of the sun gods' birthday was December the 25th. December the 25th. Christmas is, Christmas is coming. But not for us, is it? Now, now, 
Where did that come from? Constantine brought it in the church. He was going to, he wanted to stop all of these hordes from, you can see this in the barbarian series. That's what's amazing. You can see it in that. They will talk all about this, but they don't say that Christmas is pagan in there, but they, you can see the hordes coming across the, the, the continent, and you can see how they're, they're trying to stop it, and Constantine said, the way I'll stop it, I'll bring their sun gods into the church. Well, when, when Revelation 17 and 5 says that Babylon mothered all idolatry, well, if that's true, then all the idolatry, it don't matter where it is, Babylon, it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Hindus, all this is sun worship. It's all fire worship. Baal, that Israel went after, was, a, was the sun god. It don't matter whether it's on a South Sea island, South Sea island, and they're throwing some young virgin into a volcano. The volcano is the fire god. It's all about fire worship is what it's about. So when Israel was involved in Baal, or wherever you go in the world, it all comes out of Babylon. So we know that the Huns and the Vandals and the Visigoths and the, and the list goes on and on, their gods was the same gods that Israel went after when they went after Baal in the grove. Now, now where, did the, where did the sun god get the birthday? Pope Julius I gave Christ Mass its pagan name. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. When the Puritans came here from England, and they came here from Europe, they were called, they were families in Europe. They were Huguenots. Huguenots. They were Waldenses. This is their family names. They were Waldenses, and they had these other family names. When they came to America, they said, we'll call ourselves Puritans, and we'll purify this new land of all Roman Catholic and papal influences because, because uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church slaughtered the Huguenots and the Waldenses and the, and the other families that believed in predestination and election, sovereignty of God, daily cross, debt to self. Roman Catholic Church killed 60 million Christians and Jews during the Inquisition. And when they did that, the Puritans said, we will, the reason they call themselves Puritans will purify this new land of all Roman Catholic influences and they outlawed Christmas. A few years later, the Universalists and Unitarians had the law repealed, but the Protestants would have nothing to do with it till nearly 1900. America's only been celebrating Christmas for about 120 years. It is the Roman Catholic Mass. It's the festival of the Mass. Don't matter whether people like that or not, that's a fact. That's a historical fact. Now, where did this birthday come from? Christmas did not become an, it became an American holiday in 1856. There were certain people that wanted it in America, but American godly, righteous uh, people did not have anything to do with it. Coca-Cola brought out, they commissioned the painting of this new jolly old Saint Nick. Saint Nicholas was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop. Christmas Eve is the Christ Mass. It was called Mother Night in the ancient world. Mother Night. And on Mother Night, they would throw the Yule log in the fire. And when they threw the Yule log, Yule means wheel. And we have the fire wheel, which is the swastika. That's what it is. And the swastika is the Big Dipper. One more time. One more time. I want to put it up here. We're going into Christmas, and I've got... And I'm going to teach this in relationship to prophecy. The Big Dipper is, let me put it up here one more time. It's seven stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you've got the, you've got the, you have Polaris right directly above the earth, north of the earth. This would be Polaris. All right, let me put it down here a little ways. Polaris. Or the North Star. Or North Star. And then you had over here. Let me put it over here. Now this is the four seasons of the Big Dipper. Like so. This would be... 
This would be summer. This would be fall. When they would see the Big Dipper, they would see it in the sky from the earth from this viewpoint. In the summer, it would be up here in the north. In the fall, it would be over here in the west. In the, in the winter, it would be down here in the south. And then in the spring, it would be the spring, it would be here. And what you had here, what they did is they connected the lines of the Big Dipper, and this was called the Wheel of the Year. Wheel of the Year. So what you were seeing was the Big Dipper in its four phases. And they said in order to get through this hard winter, this was, this, this, you had, these are the four. You actually have eight festivals on the swastika called the Wheel of the Year. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The ones that we're talking about is Samhain, S-A-M-H-A-I-N, right here, at this point right here. That is October 31st. That Samhain was the, was the Celts, Celts form of the Feast of Saturn. Down here was Yule. This is what Constantine brought in the church and renamed the Feast of Saturn. Saturn was the father of the gods, Feast of Saturn. And you're getting into the winter months here. You're getting down here into the winter solstice where the sun is beginning to dim. What they wanted to do was get from October all the way back around to spring, Ostera. Ostera is what we call Easter. That was the resurrection of Tammuz in the ancient world, not the resurrection of Jesus. They did not celebrate the resurrection. Church did not celebrate the resurrection of Jesus one day a year. They celebrated his resurrection every first day of the week because that's the day he rose from the dead. Every first day of the week, Tammuz rose from the dead. How did we get that amalgamated with Passover? Dionysius, a Scythian monk, was commissioned by the church to, re to redo the calendar. He redid the calendar so he could amalgamate Passover and the resurrection of Tammuz or Ishtar in the ancient world. It doesn't really matter what anybody believes. This is, his this is history. This was the Frank's form of the celebration of what they did in Rome, the Feast of Saturn. And the Feast of Saturn went from December the 17th through the 24th. On the 24th, they threw the Yule log in the fire. They said it sprung out in the form of the tree the next day. And Mr. Layard and Layard's Nineveh said, since, they, since all of these gods were deified in the stars, they put a star on the top of the tree, and all of the female deities were represented in the form of a cone, not in the form of not in human form. Venus de Milo, that's a modern thing, even though it's a couple of thousand years old. So they worshipped into the form of a tree, put a star on top, and it had a platform on it. That's where the Christmas tree comes from. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh. He died to save sinners. He was born of a virgin. Christ masses heathenism. No matter whether people like that or not, that's the truth. Now, where did it come from? As we said, we've said this before. I'm going to put it on the board again so you can see this. Some of you haven't seen it. You have the sun waning as you get towards winter. It's waning. In the middle of summer, you have the summer solstice. That's the longest days of the year. Here in Middle Tennessee, the sun will come up in at the summer solstice it's about six o'clock maybe 5 30 and it won't set till about 8 45 8 45 that night maybe right close to nine o'clock that's a long day well as you get on down as you head down this is this is june 21st that's the summer solstice as you head towards winter you get to the you get to the autumn equinox Equinox means equal night. That means there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. And the next day after that, you've got 11 hours and 49, 48, 49 minutes or, or 50 minutes. Let's just say 49 minutes in that day. And then you've got 12 hours and, 50, and, and 10 minutes or whatever in the night. That means night is overtaking the light. 
And all of the pagan festivals started here on October, September, October, particularly October 31st, and that was Samhain. That was right here. Then as you get on down to winter, get into the winter, you get to the winter solstice. Winter solstice is December the 21st. December 21st, and December the 21st is the longest nights of the year. And the pagans said the sun is burning out. We've got to do something so they would light these bale fires. We call them bonfires. And they wanted to help keep the earth heated up so that they wouldn't lose the heat. And they said we've got to light up the earth, and that's why they light all the lights at the Christ Mass season. Trying to keep the earth warm. So as they, as they, when they got to the winter solstice, they said, we've got to get back to spring again. So they would offer these sacrifices at the Feast of Saturn. And from the 17th of December to the 24th of December, that was the Feast of Saturn. It was a debaucherous orgy. That's what it was. You think Jesus wants his name on that? Not on your life, he don't. They would throw the Yule log in the fire. Yule means wheel. This is the fire wheel right here. And they gave the birthday of the unconquerable son. Unconquerable son. Natalis. Solus. Solus is the word son. Natalis. Nativity means birth. Son. Natalis, Solus, and Victi. The birth of the unconquerable son. So they would gave the birthday of the sun god, December the 25th. That's, what it was, that's when the birthday of the sun was. And it was Pope Jesus the first that brought that in the church and applied that birthday to Jesus. And Jesus says, I don't want my name on any of this. This over here is the same thing as this over here. Their problem was getting from October, the end of the harvest, through the dead of winter. They didn't have Kroger, and they didn't have Publix, and they didn't have a Safeway. They wanted to get back to the harvest in the spring, but they had to go through the dead of winter. And they said, we've got to get back there. So they, they had these festivals to the sun god, and that's the truth, whether anybody likes it or not. Now, that is a bunch of super... Well, what did, where did this all start? Babylon. They said, let us build us a city and a tower, and let us make us a name, a shem, and authority. Well, what they did is they, the Bible says, once this they begin to do, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. The imagination of man has gone crazy. It don't matter whether people like it or not. Christmas is Christ Mass. It's Roman Catholicism. I have said this. I have been an analytical thinker all my life. I didn't know that's what I was when I was a little boy, but I was. And I was about 12 years old, 1951. I had never seen a TV in my life till Bill Hunter's father bought them one up the street. It was a gigantic TV. It was 12 inches. I mean, it was huge. <laughs> And my father went out and bought a great big box about like this. We were poor, but we had to have a TV. Big box about like this, had a rabbit ear on it, and had an 80 screen. And it would, in the horizontal hole, would flip, 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 flip. Don't fix the horizontal hole. Has anybody ever done that? Yeah. <laughs> and we watched everything. We'd get up on Saturday morning and watch that Indian head test pattern going on. We had never seen anything like that. What, what we did for inter... You know what I'm talking about? We'd watch it, look at it, until it came on. And one thing, we, would, we watched everything. We watched the Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve. And as a little boy, 12 years old, in 1951, I sat on that couch. I was skinny. I was little, short, squirt. And, just, and I'm sitting there with my little mind going... And there's the Pope doing the Mass, and I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, is this Christ's Mass? Did they take those two words and drop the, one of the S's and put them together to disguise it? 
is that I think Saint, we're, it's Christmas Eve and there's the Pope doing the Mass. And I think St. Nicholas is another name for Santa Claus and I think he was a Roman Catholic priest or something. He was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop. And I was sitting there as a little boy analyzing Christmas. Only thing I'd ever heard was Miss Underwood in the third grade said, children, the maple tree comes from the same thing in Russia that the Christmas tree comes from. And I'm sitting there looking at that I mean, hitting the nail on the head as a 12-year-old. It is paganism to the... Do you think the world... What does the Bible say over there in the 16th chapter of Luke? That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Does the world like Christmas? The prostitute likes it. The gangster likes it. The bank robber likes it. Unbelievers like it. Hindus like it. Buddhists like it. Baptists like it. I like to put Buddhists and Baptists together. They all like it, don't they? Well, then if it's highly esteemed among men, it stinks to God. People say, aren't you going to take a day off to celebrate a birthday of Jesus? I celebrate Him every day in my life. I witness everywhere at Publix, at Kroger's, at Kmart. Everywhere I go, I give out DVDs. I don't have time to take a day off for Jesus. I'm too busy serving Him every day. That's what we ought to be doing, isn't it? The swastika is. Swastika comes from su asti. It means it is good. It is good. And the swastis were the Tibetan Buddhist sun worshippers. Hitler sent Himmler over to, over to Tibet. He was looking for an Aryan race of, superior race of people. And the Tibetan Buddhists were... The Tibetans were a taller people, and he sent him or over there to measure their noses, to measure their arms, the length of their fingers. It's funny, he's looking for a superior race, and he was a squatty little guy with a goofy-looking mustache, wasn't he? And he wasn't a, an Aryan. What I'm trying to say to you is in Hitler, Hitler believed in this sun worship. There's a book called The Twisted Cross. It's on the swastika to tell you all about this. Hitler was a... He was into sun and tree worship. People don't know that. The swastika has been around for thousands of years. It was called the wheel of the year. And they said that the, somebody, had, somebody had to be turning that wheel so they can have crops in the spring. It was all about food. It's all it was about. And they said the queen of heaven had to be turning that. And God indicts Israel... In Jeremiah, the seventh chapter, this is 600 years before Mary is born. And the Mary of Roman Catholicism is the queen of heaven, isn't she? That just amazes me. Here she is. This is a Roman Catholic book I've got in my hand. This is given out to all Roman Catholics when you come into church, come into the Catholic church so you can, uh, let me see if I can find it here. I got, here it is. Mary, Queen of Heaven. The Queen of Heaven in the ancient world was Mylita, Aphrodite. These are all the female tree deities. Mylita means female mediatrix. It means a female mediator. Aphrodite means wrath. Don't you notice this? Wrath, subduer. In Roman Catholicism, in Roman Catholicism, it is said that the Roman Catholics pray to Mary so she can subdue the wrath of her son to keep uh, his fury and rage from coming up on the people. Malita means mediator. Well, Mary is the mediatrix or the mediator in Roman Catholicism, and she was called Queen of Heaven. And Israel is indicted in Jeremiah the 7th chapter, Jeremiah the 44th chapter, for worshiping the Queen of Heaven. And Jeremiah was prophesying to Israel for 40 years, telling them to repent of this Baal and Grove worship. And Baal's birthday was December the 25th. It don't matter whether people believe that or not. That's the truth. Now, Israel became involved in all of this. This right here, this sun winding down to the winter solstice, is the same thing as coming from summer, summer, all the way down 
to October 21st, and they had to get the Big Dipper back over here. They registered all of their crops by the Big Dipper. There are seven stars in the Big Dipper. There's also seven stars in the Pleiades. I've been thinking about this. Y'all know I've thought about this. When the Lord, when Job says, when the Lord tells Job, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and loose the bands of Orion? Pleiades was the seven stars that came up in the spring and the rabbis said the Pleiades drew the sap up and began to give them crops. Well, they also said that the will of the year gave them crops in the spring. And I've been thinking about this. The rabbi said the Pleiades brought the crops up, brought the sap up, and brought out the blooms. The sweet influences of Pleiades is not Pleiades influencing your life. The sweet influences of Pleiades, whether it actually brought the sap up or not, is not the point. The point is the rabbi said that so God uses their culture, their custom to say, Job, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? The sweet influences would be the apple blossoms the smell of the new mown hay in the springtime. That would be the sweet influences. What he's saying, I can bind Pleiades. I can stop your crops from coming. I can bring famine. That is one of my judgments. Sword, famine, pestilence, beast. If you go after these other gods, I will bring famine upon you. I will stop your crops in the spring. Orion, the evening star, was said to be, said to draw the sap down in the winter, and God says, I can loose the bands of Orion. Orion was said to by the rabbis to take the sap down so that the, the shrubs wouldn't freeze and die. We can have, let me tell you what he's talking about. To loose the bands of Orion, we're going into January. It's been real cold. And all of a sudden, we get a warm front come in. And it gets warm for about three weeks. And the crocuses come up in the middle of January. And the daffodils come up. And God hits us with a freeze and says, I'll kill your crops. That's loosening the bands of Orion at the wrong time of the year. It happens in Florida, doesn't it? That, with the orange crop and the prices go through the roof. That's loosening the bands of Orion. Well, I've been thinking. Look over here in Amos. Look here in Amos. The fifth chapter. Amos 5. I have been wrestling with whether the seven stars was Pleiades or the Big Dipper. I believe it's both. There's seven stars in Pleiades and seven stars in the Big Dipper. And notice what he says here in Amos. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. If you can find one of those, you can find it. All right. Amos, the fifth chapter, <clears throat> verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Seek not Bethel. Bethel is where they set up Baal and grove worship in Israel. Nor enter into Gilgal. They also set up idolatry there. And pass not into Beersheba, for Gilgal shall go, surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Seek the Lord, not Baal in the grove, and Shemosh, and Molech, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph. Joseph is northern Israel. Ephraim received the, the inheritance of Israel in the 48th chapter of Genesis. And devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood. Wormwood was a bitter herb. And every time Israel would go after idolatry, God would have them. He said, drink wormwood. That meant fire and trials. And leave off righteousness in the earth. Seek him that maketh the seven stars. He's saying, don't seek the seven stars. Seek him that makes the seven stars and Orion. You see that? He said, you better seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion because he's the one that brings up the crops and he's the one that kills and he's the one that brings the famine and turneth the shadow of death in the morning and maketh the day dark with night that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Don't seek Baal in the grove and golden calves and 
All the things that Israel went after. And look over here in Job. I'll just go ahead and give you this verse as long as we're talking about it. Job Psalms. It's right before Psalms. Job 38. Job 38. The Lord is asking Job some really pertinent questions. He speaks to him. And he says in verse 22, Have you entered into the treasures of the snow? Or have you seen the treasures of the snow which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? I'm the one that brings the snow. He says in the 37th chapter, The snow is mine, the winds are mine, the south winds are mine, the hurricanes are mine, the tornadoes are mine. It all belongs to me. I do all these things. Then he goes on down here and he says in verse 31, Job. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? What does that mean? It's real simple. You pick up a McClinic and Strong Encyclopedia and look up Pleiades, and it'll tell you the rabbis believe that the Pleiades brought the sap up in the vine and brought the crops. So God uses their culture and their customs and says, I can bind Pleiades. I can loose Orion. I can bring famine to you any time if you're not obedient and worship me. And Israel went after Baal in the grove, didn't they? The same system that was brought in the church and renamed Christ's Mass. Israel celebrated Christ's Mass 4,000 years ago. I've got a book called 4,000 Years of Christmas. He says, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and loose the bands of Orion? Can you bring forth Maseroth? Can you bring forth the Zodiac, is what we call it. In his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus and his sons? He says, I can do all this, and I'm doing it all. So God says, and here's, the, here's what I'm getting at. How many witnesses does it take to verify something in Israel? It takes two witnesses, doesn't it? Look at that very quickly, very quick. Look over here in, in 2 Corinthians, quick. 2 Corinthians 13, 13. I believe what God has done with the Pleiades and with the wheel of the year, he's given us two witnesses. He's given us two sets of seven stars. Look, 13th chapter of 2 Corinthians, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Look at Numbers 35. Numbers 35, this is Jewish law. Numbers 35 I don't know why I hadn't thought of this before, that these are the two sets of seven stars witnessing against Israel. Numbers 35, verse 30. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, but one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. It takes two witnesses. Look at Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Verse 6, at the mouth of two witnesses and three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. And the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death. He that is without sin, let him first cast a stone. Not cast the first stone, first. The witness to the, to the crime or to the sin had to step forward, and if he witnessed, if he said he witnessed something that wasn't true, he had to suffer the same penalty. And afterward, the hands of the people, so thou shalt put away the evil from among, among you. Chapter 19, verse 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses, or the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. And when you look over there in John 8, I've got two witnesses all through the Bible. John 8, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Pharisees, and look at John 8. I'm not going to give you all of them. John the 8th chapter. John 8. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says to the Pharisees in verse 17, it is written in your law, Pharisees, that the testimony of two men is true. You've got two sets of seven stars. You have the Pleiades and you have the will of the year.
the suvasti, or it is, you know why they called it it is good? Because they wanted to get from Samhain or October 31st and get all the way back around and have that, and have that, that Big Dipper get all the way around here. There's many names for the swastika. They call it the field fight. They call it Thor's Hammer. And it's got many other names. You've got, you got a variation of it, which is the Maltese Cross. Maltese Cross. And when you see the Maltese Cross, that is nothing but a form of the swastika, and this is on the vestments of the Pope. You can watch the Midnight Mass, and he's got it all over his vestments. Well, by the way, that was on the American Indian's garb too, wasn't it? Where do you think the American Indian came from? All life began in Sumar, the Mesopotamian Valley. That's where it all began. So the American Indian either had to come across the Bering Strait or he had to roll across uh, the Pacific. That's also the symbol for a firefighter. For a firefighter. That's amazing, isn't it? When you see a man's head, and he's a saint, and you'll see that behind him, that's called the nimbus. And that's supposed to be the sun god behind the heads of his saints. Or you see the halo. The halo is the sun god. So whenever you see halos and somebody's trying to make somebody look holy, that's not holy. That's sun worship is what it is. It's amazing how ignorant America is. Now, goodness. I'll come back and do some more on this. So this is, and this is, let me give you one other thing. When the arms are breaking to the left, now somebody will turn on here and say, that's a bunch of Nazis on there. You know, no, we don't believe in this. That's what I'm trying to get to you. I'm trying to tell you where it comes from. Uh, the, when it breaks to the left, it's called the sinistro gyrate. It gyrates to the left. When it breaks to the right, it goes against nature. This is the way Hitler, Hitler turned it around. And it goes against nature, and it's called the dextrogyrate, or to the right. And this is supposed to be in completely rebellion against nature. This is the good luck symbol. In fact, America used this as a good luck symbol in early America. We got a, I got a card from, uh, let's see if I got it here. We got a card from the uh, Doyles up in Wisconsin. This was a New Year's card given to their grandmother by their grandfather. And it says, sent in all sincerity, kindest regards and greetings. Greetings, gay, much joy to you on New Year's Day. And there's a swastika right in the middle of it. And I blew it up. And that was a, crisp, a New Year's card in about 1908 in America. Hitler got a hold of it and then he went crazy with it, but it's still the wheel of the year. And we get the wreath from this, the circular wreath. <coughs> if you're going to do Christmas, just put a swastika on your door instead of a wreath, okay? That way people know what it is. <coughs> now, Israel went after this same system of Baal and Grove. Now let me get to prophecy, okay? Prophecy is about all of this. This is the system that Israel went after. And God destroyed Israel for it. He carried them away into captivity because they went after this Baal, Grove, Shemosh, Molech. Shemosh, Israel got involved in worshiping all the gods around them. And they worship, this is Jordan right here. If this is Israel, this is Israel. And this is Jordan right here. Well, southern Jordan was the land of Moab. Northern Jordan was the land of Ammon. Ammon worshipped worshipped Molech, and that was the same thing, or Moloch, or Milcom, or Malcolm. They were all variations of the same word. That was the sun god of the land of Ammon, and Israel was worshipping Baal, the sun god, and the birthday of all these sun gods was December the 25th. And Moab worshipped Shemosh, and Israel got involved in worshipping Shemosh. Solomon, in 1 Kings, 
the 11th chapter, he married 700 pagan wives, 300 concubines, took on their gods and worship, worshipped Moloch and Shemosh and Baal and Grove, and he worshipped the Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth comes from the word aster. That is the Greek word star. Since they were all deified in the stars, they worship the asteroid. That's the female tree deities. That is the Christmas tree. It don't matter whether anybody likes it or not. That's what it is. And that was the asteroid or the aster or the star gods. That's why Mr. Layard says they put the star on the top of the tree and that the asteroid were worshipped in the form of a cone. Now, what in the world does this have to do with prophecy? Israel was involved in this. Let me give you a real quick rundown. And it does it don't matter whether people believe this or not, this is the truth. Good grief, man. Just go online, look at pagan origins of holidays. I've got books. I, you, you can get uh, Stephen Nissenbaum's book, The Battle for Christmas. He'll tell you all about it. Christmas has put on a new face since 1900. Santa Claus was a skinny little guy, skinny little white guy with a long pipe, and he had a black demon that went with him everywhere he went. That was in 1850 in America. They had to put a new face on it to get America to believe it. Now, what does this have to do with Israel? Israel, the Bible is the study of a family. One family. Like the old radio show, One Man's Family. Nobody remembers that but me. Maybe somebody else does. It starts with Adam there in Genesis. The fifth chapter, he's had a son named Enosh. Enos has a son named Canaan. Canaan has a son named Mahalalel. Mahalalel has a son named Jared. Jared has a son named Enoch. Enoch has a son named Methuselah. Methuselah has a son named Lamech. Lamech has a son named Noah. These are all grandsons. This is the, this is the covenant lineage of God right here, Genesis 5. And then you get over to Genesis 11. Noah's got three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Out of Japheth will come the Caucasian race, a bunch of barbaric people. Out of Ham will come the Negroid race. Out of Shem will come the Semitic race. We get the word Semitic from that. The Semitic race. And then whenever you get over here and you start with Shem's son, Arphaxid, and Arphaxid has a son. Let me just give you all these guys. This takes you all the way down. You start with Arphaxid, the son of Shem. Arphaxid. And Arphaxid has a son. His name is Salah. Salah. Salah has a son. His name is Eber. Eber has a son. His name is Peleg. Peleg has a son. His name is Reu. Reu has a son. His name is Serug. So these are father, grandson, grandson, Great grandson, great great grandson, great 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 grandson, great 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 grandson, and so forth, all the way down to Serug, and Serug has a son, and his name is Nahor. Nahor has a son. Nahor has a son. His name is Terah. Terah has a son. His name is Abram, and his name is changed to Abraham, and Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. And God picked out this family. This is his family here, Israel. Israel means to prevail with God. So he has a son named Israel. Israel has sons from Reuben all the way to Benjamin. Reuben and Simeon and, and Levi and, and Judah and Dan and Asher. And the list goes all the way down to Joseph and Benjamin all of these, this is the nation of Israel. Then Israel, through Joseph, is put into bondage in Egypt. Joseph goes into Egypt. His brothers sell him in Egypt in the 37th chapter of Genesis. And, he stay, and Israel stays in Egypt 400 years. And then they're brought out of Egypt by Moses. And God gives Moses a law. He says, I gave this land to Abraham in Genesis 17. And if you... If you're obedient to me, you have to obey me. If you're obedient, I'll fill up your storehouses. 
I'll fill up your fields. You'll have all the food in the world. I'll fill up your wombs. All your babies will be healthy. You'll go against your enemy one way and they'll flee seven ways. And you will, as long as you're obedient to me. Well, when you quit obeying me, you go after other gods. I'm going to send the sword, the famine, the pestilence. And then finally, I will send the beast to carry you away into captivity. Did Israel stay obedient to God? No, sir, they didn't. Nope. They're 400 years in Egypt. Moses brings them back. Moses warns them. He says, you obey God or God's going to bring all of this upon you. So he starts off here in, in, in Judges. He brings them back. They're under Judges. They come back after 400 years in Egypt. They're carried off into Egypt. They're, Joseph is sold in Egypt. They stay there 400 years. They come out of Egypt, wander in the wilderness 40 years, come back, cross that Jordan River just north of the Dead Sea and come in to possess the land. And he says, when you go in, if you, if you go after other gods, remember, all gods came out of Babylon, didn't they? Babylon mothered it all. So whenever Constantine brought the Christ Mass into the church, it's the same thing that Israel gets involved in under another name, another title. It's just a different culture, but it's the same gods. It's the worship. It's ancestor worship of Nimrod, the sun god. Birthday, December the 25th. I did a tape one time called Demons. Demons began at Babel, didn't they? The demons were the gods, Hercules and Venus, and all the demons' birthdays was December the 25th. I did a tape one time called Demons Are Born on December the 25th. And that's the truth. What does all this have to do with living godly and righteously to us? Nothing. Now, so he brings them back. They're under judges for about 300 years. Then we get to the history of Israel. Israel as a nation, 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. This is from Saul, the first king of Israel, David, the second king of Israel, Solomon, the third king of Israel. And then it goes on down, and then the kingdom is split because of Saul's apost Solomon's apostasy. And God splits the nation into northern Israel and southern Israel, or Judah, southern Judah, and then he says, if you keep going after these gods, and for 500 years under kings, they went after Baal, Grove, Shemosh, Molech, Ashtaroth, the same system that was brought in the church and renamed Christmas. It's amazing. And the reason God scattered them was because they were going after these gods. So, here's what happens. I cannot tell you, I can't get into all the details in every message. I hope you understand that. This is a series. You have to back up about five weeks, listen to all of them. Each message is not a message in itself. You understand? If you want all the details, listen to all of them. I don't have time to go through all the details in one message. Now, so what happens with Israel? Their nation... For 500 years, 1 Samuel, 2 Chronicles. 1 Samuel. This is called the books of the kings. These six books are called the books of the kings. They're all like one book to the Jew. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. When you get to 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter, the last chapter of these books, southern Judah is carried away into Babylon Northern Israel had been carried away in, five, in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. Southern Judah is carried away by Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian system. And they're kept, they have been carried away into captivity for 2,600 years. From, from 586 B.C. until they become a nation May 14th. 1948. And then, of course, Zionism. Zionism was an effort on the part of the Jews. It began in 1896 by a man named Theodore Tichio D-U-R Herzl. He saw a Jew killed on the streets 
of Paris, and he said, we've got to have our own land. So they started, huh? Herzl. He, they said, we have to have a land of Israel. So they started an offering, and all the Jews had, had by their doors a place to give an offering. They could not foresee, they could not foresee Israel being liberated in 1917 at the end of World War II by General Allenby, and he said, I will not walk into this. He said, I will not ride my horse into this town where my Lord has, has walked and trod. So he walked into Jerusalem, took, took Jerusalem after 400 years under the Ottoman Turks. The Arabs had been living there 700 years. And, after, and then that Balfour Declaration was issued where Israel would become where Israel would become a nation, where there would be an effort to make Israel a nation, they became a satellite of the British Commonwealth, and then that Balfour Declaration expired, May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation for the first time since they were carried away, and they were carried away because they went after Baal, Grove, Shemash, Molech, the same system that was brought in the church and renamed Christ Mass. Christmas and prophecy have everything to do with each other. Christmas is that bell and grove worship. And God says, I've had it. And then the Bible says in Luke 21, 24, They, the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they'll be led away captive into all nations. Well, that's the beast, isn't it? They're going to be led away captive, and Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentile rule over the Jews is done. Well, Jerusalem was trodden down until the Six-Day War of June June 5th through June 10th of 1967 where the Jordanians were thrown out and the Jews gained Jerusalem for the first time since 586 B.C. And it's all over this Christ mass system. Christmas and prophecy are the same thing. You can't study Christmas without studying prophecy. You can't study prophecy without studying Christmas. And you know how ignorant America is? They're dumber than a bunch of rocks. Preachers... Even if they know Christmas is pagan, they'll say, well, God don't mind. What are you talking about, God don't mind? You think he didn't mind Israel and he killed him by the, the last Assyrian to slaughter the Jews was an Assyrian named Adolf Hitler. He killed six million of them during World War II. What do you think that was about? God says, this is my last lick on you. He picked up Hitler as a sword in his hand and David said, Deliver me from the wicked which is thy sword in thy hand. And he cut him down, whistling one last time. And he said, It'll never happen again. Now, you mean Israel got involved in all that? God said, when you see the term in the Bible, and the Bible says, when this happens, this generation is not going to pass away till all is fulfilled. When we see the Gentile rule over the Jews finished. Now, Israel was involved in this. When you see the words, the reason Israel is having all this problem, all of the world, all the world is looking at this little nation. Every eye is upon it. It's smaller than New Jersey. And the entire world is looking at it. All the world is watching. The end of time has to do with this going on over here. Here's the Gaza Strip here. Here's the Dead Sea. Here's the West Bank. Here's the Sea of Galilee up here. And everything that's going on over here, the Turks here, the, Assyri the Syrians here, uh, Iraq over here, Iran over here, it's, uh, they're all part of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they're going to amass together a great army in Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, and this has never happened before, where Gog and Magog is going to attack Israel, and Gog is the beast system. Now, when you see the words in the Old Testament, scatter, scattereth, and you see sword, famine, pestilence, and you see the beast, the fourth judgment of God. These are the four judgments of God. Ezekiel, the 14th chapter, calls them God's four sore judgments. The beast is Babylon. The Babylon is thrown, overthrown by Persia. Persia is overthrown by Greece. 
Greece is overthrown by Rome, and they are ruling Israel. Babylon carries them to captivity. Persia inherits that mantle, then Greece, then Rome. And the Jews have been ruled for 2,600 years by the world, and they've fallen by the sword until this generation. We're looking at, I believe we're looking at eternity. I don't see how it can be far down the road. Now, when you see these words scattered, let me show you something. Go back over here to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. This is not my opinion. It's nothing to do with opinion. The Bab Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist scholar of the 1800s, died in the 1890s, said that Christmas was a wickedness. And it is. What is it really about? Spending and money and glutton and stuff in it. I want, where's my gifts and what's my, is that all there is? And I want more than spend and, and credit cards and, and getting drunk and, and office parties. And it's all about, that's what it's about. And the Christians are, it's kind of, I've said this before. Christians are one, but we want to put Jesus' name on it. We want to be a part of it. That's like having a hookers convention down here at the Hyatt Regency and saying, we're going to go down there, and we're not going to participate with the hookers, but we're going to have our room on the same floor while they're going in there with their johns, and we're going to be Christians going in here, and we're going to go down here and listen to this band while they're playing, and we're going to sit at our table, and the hookers and the homosexuals are going to sit at their table, and we're going to be right in the middle of them, but we're not going to have anything to do with them. What? Can you do that? No, you can't do that. Come out and be separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather rebuke them. If anyone preaches any other doctrine, do not bid them Godspeed. Don't receive them into your household. If you bid them Godspeed, you partake of their evil deeds. Godspeed, Carol, means to be cheerful to them. Hi, how are you doing, Miss Hooker? <laughs> well, we're not down here to do any hooking. We're just down here to, down here to see the show. Yeah, we're just looking. Yeah, not looking. We're just looking. Now look at look at Deuteronomy twenty-eight. Deuteronomy twenty-eight. This is the famous chapter of the Bible concerning this in Le Leviticus twenty-six. He's talking about if you keep my commandments. In the first part of the chapter, it shall come to pass, verse one, if thou shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all His commandments which I commanded this day that the Lord thy God will set thee above, on high above the nations of the earth and all these blessings are going to come upon you. You're going to be blessed in the city, in the field. Verse 3, your body's going to be blessed. The fruit of your body is sheep, your cattle, your kind, your basket, your store. And you'll go against your enemy one way and they'll flee seven ways in verse 7. Then he says in verse 15, it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe in His commandments and His statutes, what I shall command thee this day, that all these curses are going to come upon you. You're going to be cursed in the field, in your basket, in your store, in your bodies. He said, I'm going to, I will bring, the Lord shall send, the Lord shall send in verse 20. Not the devil, the Lord shall send. Vexation, rebuke, all you set your hand to do because of the wickedness of your doings. And the Lord shall smite thee. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee in verse 21. It is the Lord's will. It won't be you. It won't be the devil. God's going to do it. He'll consume you from off the land. Whether you go to possess it, God's going to rip Israel off the land. And he did. Now they're back. Why? For the end. This thing is not going to stop over that. I don't care how many peace talks they have. I don't care how many people in the world vote for the petitioning of a Palestinian state. Israel is not, it's going to be a war till the end of all these desolations are determined there in Daniel 9, 27. Everything that God's determined is going to be. The Lord shall smite thee with consumption. Only God will hit you with consumption. Israel, he's not talking about pagans, he's talking about Israel. And with a fever and with inflammation, with extreme burning, with a sword, with blasting, with mildew. This don't sound like the God of the Charismatics, does it? 
God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't hurt anybody. He said, therefore will I make thee sick and smiting thee because of thy sin. What are you talking about God won't hurt people? He'll kill you. That's a permanent sickness, isn't it? And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass. There won't be any rain. And the earth will be like iron and you won't have any crops and there'll be famine. And he'll make you rain of your land powder in verse 24. And the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out against them one way in verse 25 and flee seven ways. And shalt be removed unto all the kingdoms of the earth. And that happened in 586 to southern Judah and northern Israel in 722. That happened. But they're not scattered anymore. I believe literally this was a time clock for the end of time. I've been studying this since 1964. Preaching the 70 weeks of Daniel. And we're going to get back to that in this series. So when he says you'll be removed. That is the same thing when you see the word scatter. Look over here. Look. Did Israel get involved in this? You bet your life they did. Go over here to Leviticus. 26. Leviticus 26 is the sister chapter to Deuteronomy 28. It's a sister. It's the same words practically. But it says some things. Look here, 26. All right. He says, if you're disobedient to me, and you're not obedient to my words... In verse 14, if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, here's what I'm going to do to you. Verse 17, I will set my face against you. You will be slain before your enemies. They shall hate you and shall reign over you and you'll flee when none pursueth you. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, I will punish you seven times for your sins and I will break the pride of your Power, I will make your heaven iron and your earth brass. No rain, no food, no crops. Famine, judgment. It says in verse 21, And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues, pestilence. Here's two judgments right here, aren't they? Upon you according to your sins. Verse 24, that's pestilence. Verse 24. Then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you. Sword, famine, pestilence. We hit those first three, haven't we? Sword, famine, pestilence. Look at the last judgment. And look at... He says in verse 30, I will destroy your high places and cut down your images, cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols... And my soul shall abhor you, Israel. I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries into desolation. I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. I will bring the land in desolation. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar came in, did when he came in, burnt the temple to the ground, burnt the city to the ground, pulled all the stones of the temple down, plowed, a, plowed up through it and sowed it with salt so nothing would grow there. Until the Persian Empire, until they said, go back and build your city, Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, said, I'm going to give decrees for you. Go back and rebuild your temple and rebuild your city. And the rebuilding of the city is the beginning of the 70 weeks of Daniel, 70 weeks. And that will be the beginning of the prophecies concerning the end of time where we will be able to kind of see what's happening. We will know the season. We won't know the day nor the hour. Verse 32, I'll bring the land into desolation. Your enemy shall dwell therein. And shall be astonished at it, at it. I will scatter you. Beast. Right? You'll be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth. And will draw out a sword after you. And your land shall be desolate. And your cities waste. And then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath. They had a Sabbath. A sabbatical year every seven years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they never kept those sabbatical years. And they had 70 sets of these, 70 times 7, and that's the 70 weeks of Daniel. We'll get back into that later. Now, did Israel do this constantly? Look over here. Nehemiah. Look at, look, look at Deuteronomy 30 first. Deuteronomy 30. I'm just going to give you a bunch of these. Deuteronomy 30. The reason Israel is scattered, the reason they're back, 
the reason the World Trade Center came down is the Arabs have said, anyone who sides with Israel is against our Al-Fatah, which, which is a decree that has been made by the Arabs, says if you get into the, if you try to divert the expansion of, of Islam, that you place yourself in jihad, holy war, and when the United States sided with Israel at the petitioning of Israel becoming a nation, May 14, 1948, we were automatically in jihad with the Arabs without any war being declared. That's according to their culture, according to their beliefs. You're in jihad against them. So the fact that they came and crashed the planes in the World Trade Center, the reason they crashed the planes in the World Trade Center is because Israel celebrated Christmas under another name in the ancient world. That's why. It sounds strange, doesn't it? But that's the truth. All of it has to do with the same thing. Now look at Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30. I want to give you some of these. How much time do I have? Boy, I'm not even hardly getting started on this. I'm going to give you some of them fast. Deuteronomy 3.3. 3. That the Lord thy God shall turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and I will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. He's talking about what he will do. Well, that has happened, hasn't it? In the last 50 years, that's happened. He says, I'll gather you from where I've scattered you. Look over here in, in uh, 4 and 27. Look at Deuteronomy 4. Look at 4 and 27. Four twenty-seven, and the Lord shall scatter you among the heathen, among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. There's a verse in this chapter. Is Christmas adding to the Word of God? Yes, it's adding to it. You say, what's so bad about Christmas? It is the heathenism of the ancient world. <coughs> I've been teaching on the doctrine of the devil on Sunday night been talking about mass mind control. If you repeat something over and over and over and over, Christmas is okay, Christmas is okay. It's about drunkenness. There's more suicides at Christmas. There's more booze sold at that time of the year than any other time of the year. More people die in car wrecks. More. In the 1800s, Mr. Nissenbaum says, in his Battle for Christmas book, he says there's more December the 25th at that time more unwed pregnancies nine months after Christmas than any other time. That's the sexual time of the year. It's a time for sex at office parties. Get together and just, if it feels good, do it. That's what it's for. Now, where was I? If, if, is Christmas adding to the Word of God? Yes, it is. Jesus is God in the flesh, dying to save sinners, born of a virgin, in a manger. But Christmas is Christ Mass. It's Roman Catholicism. You're not supposed to be doing it unless you're a Roman Catholic. <laughs> you say, I don't like that. I'll tell you what, those of us that quit doing it, isn't it the greatest relief in the world? It's like, gosh, I don't have to go to Rivergate. I don't have to spend money I don't have. It, the first year you quit doing it, your family will say, you've joined a cult. And you give them all this, you give them all this uh, and they're right. Cult means to cultivate. What they meant to say is you've joined an occult. Occult means to hide. All the early Christians were called cult of Christians. That's just how dumb they are on that. What did I start to tell you? Family oh, first, the first year, you don't celebrate it. Your family says, you're crazy. You've gone off the deep end. You've done this and you've done that. The next year, they've read some things. They've seen specials like Christmas Unwrapped. They've got all kinds of specials on Christmas being pagan, on Discovery, and on... It's, it's all over the TV this time of the year. I saw one the other night. I even forgot the name of it. It's gotten to where I don't even call anybody anymore. We, it's everywhere. And the first year, your family gets mad and says you're nuts and out of your mind, and they scream and get mad at you, and your mama gets mad and yells at you, and, you can at least come over here and do this and, and do this with us. 
The second year, they've heard and read and seen some Christmas specials, and they've told friends, uh, my son quit celebrating Christmas. Well, yeah, I know it's pagan, and the friend will say, yeah, well, it is pagan, but I like it. We don't do it that way. And they'll say, we don't do it that way. <laughs> well, and next time somebody says, we don't do it that way, ask them, just how do you keep the customs of the heathen? How do you do it? The Bible says we're not to add this to God's word. Look here in Deuteronomy 4. By that third year, they see you and they know so much about it because they've heard people talk about it. They go, hi, Jim, I have to go. I can't, don't have time to talk. And they run. Don't they? They will get away from you. Because you don't have to beat them up. We didn't say Christmas is pagan. It's Christ, Mass, it's Roman Catholic. And that's what it is. And, and Saint Nick has nothing to do with God. Look here. Look here in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Is Christmas adding to the word? Yes. The word is yasaf, augment. Ye shall not augment the word of God or add something to it. Neither shall ye diminish, gara, remove. Don't remove a daily cross at Christ's mass time. Just stand up and tell the truth. Neither shall you diminish aught from it that you keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Go to Deuteronomy 12. People say it's just customs and culture of the pagans. Look at Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12. Verse 32, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. And look back here in verse 30 of that same chapter. Take heed to thyself, that thou, might, that thou be not snared following these pagans, after that they be destroyed from thee, and that thou inquire not after their God, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? God says, I don't want you to even inquire and find out how they serve their gods or the culture, the customs. I don't want you even wanting, I don't want you knowing how they did it, much less doing it. And look at Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18. You think God wants us to do that? I don't think so. It's really hard to start off, but after a while, people get used to you. They say, don't ask Jim, he'll tell you. Don't talk to him about Christmas. Hi, Jim. Hey, they're scared. They get scared of you after a while. Especially when you have something and they have nothing. Look here at Deuteronomy 18. Verse 30. Verse 30. Therefore shall you keep mine ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. He's not even telling them don't serve their gods because God knows that Israel knows they're not gods. He says don't keep their customs which were committed before you and that you defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. Don't do this. Look at Now, let's get back to scattering. Go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, was living in 444. This is around 445, 444 B.C. And, and Israel was carried captive in 586 B.C. Southern Judah was. So Nehemiah is in the captivity. He is in the scattering. He is in the being removed. He's one of the people living over here in Babylon. He's a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. Living in Babylon. He's a Jew. And he's going to get a decree to go back and rebuild the city. Look here at Nehemiah. Nehemiah Esther Job. Look at Nehemiah, the first chapter, verse 8. Nehemiah is one of the guys that has been carried away, or his family had been carried away. He's living in Babylon. Verse 8, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. And he was scattered over there with him, and he was a righteous man. 
I'm just trying to point out to you a lot of the places. Now go over here to Jeremiah 30. Go to Jeremiah 30. Was Israel scattered? Yes. Are they back? Yes. Let's go to Jeremiah 30. Look at verse 11. 30, 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee. He says, I have scattered you among the nations. By this time, there had been two deportations under Jeremiah's prophecies in, in uh, 605 and 597. The final deportation was the slaughter of Israel in 586 B.C. Now, look here in Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. I don't have time to read them all. Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel was carried off in the captivity around 597. 597 B.C. That was a peaceful deportation of southern Judah. 605 was the first deportation. And then 586 B.C. was the final destruction of Jerusalem. Ezekiel is carried away. Now he's reminding us. Look here in Ezekiel. He's reminding us of what God will do when you go after other gods. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, 20. And look here in verse 18. 20 and 18. And I'm going to stay on this subject, 2018. <sighs> and he says here in Ezekiel 20, verse 18. I'm in the right chapter. Yeah, 2018. But I said unto their, unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes. Keep my judgments and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, notwithstanding. The children of Israel rebelled against me and went after Baal in the grove and Shemash and Moloch, etc. They walked not in the statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which is, if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them, to accomplish mine anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew mine hand and wrought for my name's sake, that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen, in whose sight I brought them. I lifted up mine hand unto them in the wilderness, that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them through the countries. That's what he did, didn't he? Now they're back. What are they doing back for the end of time? The war is not going to stop there yet. If Obama wants some advice on it, he can call me and I can tell him. It's not going to stop. Your peace treaties will be temporary. If it all stops, if it all stops and they get peace in the Middle East, throw your Bible away and let's go party because the Bible's not true. That's the only way that they can have peace. Permanent peace. Oh, they'll have temporary here and there. But it's not going to happen. If the Bible's true, there will be no permanent peace. They will say peace when there is no peace. There'll be no peace till the Prince of Peace comes. And he'll fix it. Which verse is that? 24. What chapter am I in? 24. Because they had executed my judgments, they had not executed my judgments and had despised my statutes and polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. This is real simple. Every one of the prophets is preaching about Israel going after idolatry and God scattering them. That's all the Old Testament is basically about. It's scattering this family that we talked about a while ago. Is that saying they were going after their sun gods? They were going after their sun gods. That's what they're doing, yeah. Oh, man. And look at, look at thir verse 34 and verse 41. 34. I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered. That happened. That started happening in 1917, 1920, May 14, 1948, the Six-Day War of 67, the Sinai War, the Yom Kippur War of 73. It all happened in those times. This is happening in, in my lifetime. I've had people say, yes, but they've been talking about the incoming for hundreds of years. There's things happened in the last 60 years that have never happened before. 
You understand that? We're not talking about 1850. There was no Israel. Kill and deletes, which is a commentaries I've got, Mr. Kill and Mr. Deletes, could not foresee Israel ever being a nation in Israel ever again. Even Alvin McLean, when he wrote his 70 Weeks of Daniel book in 1940, he couldn't see Israel being a nation in 1948. It was impossible to see it. They were being slaughtered by the Nazis. Oh, amazing, huh? Verse 47. Verse 47. Oh, was it 47? No, 41. 41. I will accept you with your sweet savor when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein you have been scattered. That happened in the 20th century. You can just jump to the 20th century with this verse. And I will sanctify you before the heathen. They were not gathered out of the countries where they were scattered in the days of Jesus. They were still being ruled by Rome. The Roman garrisons were all over Jerusalem. When you see, when you see Jerusalem campused with armies, they were campused with armies from 586 to the Six-Day War of 1967, June 5th through June 10th. That's, they were in captivity that long. Christmas and prophecy have to do with one another. We see that? Now, <laughs> do I have any time? I've got all kinds of verses. Let me just give you a couple of verses on Israel going after Baal. Go over to Judges 2. They come out of, they come out of Egypt for 400 years. They come out of, they come out of 40 years in the wilderness. Joshua Judges. Judges, the second chapter. Israel goes in and possesses the land. They intermarry with these pagan sun and tree worshipers. They marry them. God says, don't marry. Don't give your sons and daughters to their sons and daughters. Don't intermarry them. You're going to be polluted by their gods. And they were. They did and they were. So Joshua dies. Verse 8, chapter 2, Judges. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in verse 9. Verse 11. The children of Israel, well, let me read verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after these in the generation of Joshua. The, Israel was purified when they came across the Jordan River to repossess the land. They had been purified. God killed off all the unbelievers out there in the wilderness in 40 years. And he says, and a new generation arose after them which knew not the Lord. Boy, that's like a neon sign. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Which knew not the Lord in Israel. Nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. I am on the end of word is plural. Served all the gods of Baal, the sun gods. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed after gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger, and they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. What is wrong with you, Israel? What are you thinking? And then all through the book of Judges, a judge would rise up. Othniel would rise up. They'd cry out, Oh, God, we're... The Midianites or the Philistines are after us and deliver us. And God had sent Othniel and he'd send Jephthah or he'd send Ehud. And they'd deliver them and make Israel start serving God. And then Israel would fall away and go back after Baal in the grove. It's like, you guys don't get it, do you? But does America get it? Do we get it? Remember, idolatry is to serve what you see. Are you guilty of that? Are you guilty of looking and wanting? Put in your eyes and you want it. Watch out what you look at and what you hear. And then you get over there to that, that uh, third chapter. The third chapter, verse 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Baal in the grove. 
Hercules and Venus, whose birthday was December the 25th in the Christmas tree. 8 and 33. Look at 8 and 33. 8 and 33. They kept all through Judges going back after Baal, the sun god, whose birthday was December the 25th. And God scattered them because of that. And they stayed scattered. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Luke 21, 24. My fa one of my favorite verses concerning prophecy. They'll fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentile until the Gentile rule is over the Jews is fulfilled. And it's done. You, you know, you would think people would be thinking about eternity, wouldn't you? But the world is not George Bush or George Sr. or Obama or George Romney or Bill Clinton don't have any idea what's going on over there. They think they know. They think it's oil and they think it's this and they think it's that. It's about the land. God says, I gave the land to Abraham. He said, the land is mine and you can't buy it and sell it or give it to anybody. In that last chapter of Numbers, it can't be given away. I am watching prophecy that I've been preaching for over 50 years unfold before my very eyes and I'm expecting something to happen every day. I'm expecting explosions or bombs to go off or nuclear warheads to go off in America. And I believe that'll happen before it's over with. You know what would really disturb America? Blow up one NFL stadium on a Sunday. You know that would shake America to its core. It would be so emotional. It would shake them down to their feet. And it might happen. I might have given them an idea. It doesn't have to be something necessarily that's just money. It can be something that will shake our stability, our minds. Do I have any time? Huh? And gosh, when you get into the sixth chapter of Judges, the Lord tells, they keep going at back after these Baal and Grove gods, which is the Christmas system. They keep going after it. And God keeps telling them to quit doing it. And they keep going back after it. And you'd think that Israel would somehow get a hold of it. But they don't. And the Lord tells, in the sixth chapter of Judges, the Lord tells Gideon, you go throughout the land and destroy all the Baal and grove worship in the land. I want all these gods out of here. And he does. And the men of Israel come to Joash, who is Gideon's father, and they say, we want you to bring out Gideon. We want to kill him. And Joash, Gideon's father, said, well, if Baal is a god, why don't you let him fight his own battles? Huh? If he's a god, can he fight for himself? Why do you have to kill Gideon? Why don't you let Baal kill him? Because Baal is a dead god. He has no breath. I'm out of time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for truth. Help us to continue this work. Help us to understand that everything that's going on in the world right now is about this Christmas in prophecy, Lord. Everything is happening according to your eternal purpose, the way you want it to happen. Thank you for truth. We pray that you'll cause us to continue this work, lead us to your elect. I pray for the flock here that you'll strengthen the flock, cause them to read the word and stay in the truth. And we'll give you praise and glory for everything. Lead us to your elect. In Christ's name, amen.